Hey, Kat. Welcome back to Unfold. It's great to be back, Amy. <laughs> what What are you doing with a basketball in a studio? What, this? Thought I'd just, you know, shoot some hoops. There are no hoops in here. Well, I brought it as an audio aid and a visual aid. And what am I trying to visualize exactly besides you playing basketball? Did you know that one basketball is about a quarter of a cubic foot in volume? So four of these basketballs is one cubic foot. I'm struggling to think of a ball as a foot, let alone a cubic one. Okay, well, imagine this basketball is full of water. Ooh, I think I see where you're going with this analogy. We're going to be talking about water. That's right. Groundwater, the water in our aquifers. Jay Lund gave me this analogy, actually. Hmm. He founded our Center for Watershed Sciences. He's also an engineer, so he kind of likes to do math. Yeah, so let me throw some numbers your way. Over the last century, California has lost 120 million acre feet of groundwater from Central Valley aquifers. So that's the amount of water that Californians have overpumped from aquifers. And what's an acre foot again? An acre foot is enough water to cover an acre of land a foot deep. So we're talking about 120 million acre feet over the last century in the Central Valley. Wow, I just can't imagine that. Is that like overdrawing $120 million from my bank account or something? Yeah, if you want to consider groundwater a bank account. But back to the basketball. Let's start smaller. How about imagining 2,600 basketballs? Can you imagine that? Kind of. Just because it's a lot, it's difficult. It is a lot. So you're comparing our groundwater over pumping to 2,600 basketballs. No, it's actually 2,600 basketballs for every person living on Earth today, just in the Central Valley. Whoa. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hydrologist Thomas Harder with UC Davis says it's not sustainable. We're over pumping about 2 million acre feet a year now in the San Joaquin Valley. With the mega drought that we are experiencing um, currently, you know, even with these rains, not right now, that problem has been exacerbated and probably extended to other places in California. Yeah, the mega drought. So that's a good reminder that just because we've had a parade of atmospheric rivers and snowstorms this winter and spring doesn't mean we no longer worry about drought. Just last year, farmers didn't plant many of the crops they normally would. Yeah, I met a farmer that followed land this year, Nick Edsel. He's the orchard manager for Bullseye Farms in Yolo County. We removed walnut trees um, this year because the market's just really bad and um, we feel like we need to use our resources, especially water resources, for other more valuable crops. He removed even permanent crops like nut trees? Yeah, 500 acres of young walnut trees. And like a lot of farmers, Nick relies primarily on groundwater, especially in a drought year. With a lot of permanent crops coming in, it's put quite a demand on, on groundwater. And without any surface water the last few years, we've been running low. Every year we're just crossing our fingers hoping that we uh, don't have problems or run out of water. Most farmers turn to groundwater during droughts. But increasingly, farmers are not only finding ways to conserve groundwater, but also capture stormwater to help replenish thirsty aquifers. But managing groundwater in this extreme climate is a huge undertaking. In this episode of Unfold, we'll examine how UC Davis scientists are working to make groundwater more sustainable and help California remain the most productive agricultural state in the nation. Coming to you from UC Davis, this is Unfold. I'm Amy Quinton. And I'm Kat Curlin. Just last year, UC researchers found that farms pumped 27% more groundwater than in 2019. Groundwater overpumping has caused lands to subside or sink. It's reduced water quality and resulted in higher energy costs to pump water from even deeper wells. It dried up some wells, forcing some communities to go without a clean source of drinking water. State law now requires managers of the state's most depleted aquifers to bring those basins into balance by 2040. Well, no silver bullet exists, but scientists at the UC Davis Agricultural Water Center are working with farmers to find solutions. 
They have more than 15 research sites in the Central Valley alone. One of those sites is a pistachio orchard on Nick Edsel's farm in Yolo County. The ground on this orchard is dry and hard. Dead tree leaves crunch beneath my feet. And it's January, shortly after four atmospheric rivers pummeled California. Nick Edsel says on this portion of the orchard, water doesn't seep into the soil. The water runs to the end of the field and pools and puddles, and it eventually either runs into a drain or it sits on the field for, you know, multiple days to weeks. And um, you'll see standing water. But not too far away in the same orchard, it's a different story. Knee-high green grasses and radishes flourish between the rows of trees. These are winter cover crops. This is a big radish right here. Look at that. Nick pulls up a daikon radish, the biggest I've ever seen. It looks like a giant white carrot, the width of a softball. And it's supposed to open up pores in the soil, so it's doing its job. Those giant pores allow water from rains to seep into the ground and help recharge the aquifer beneath the field. UC Davis Agricultural Water Center Director Isaiah Kaseka says cover crops improve that infiltration. If you have cover crops like this, you're going to improve soil structure, which is going to improve water holding capacity, but also by covering the soil, you're going to protect the soil aggregates. If you don't have cover crops, the rainfall or sprinkler irrigation breaks up the aggregate, seals the soil, and then water runs off. Cover crops grow on half of the 5,000 acres of orchards on Bullseye Farms. Nick says he planted cover crops several years ago to fix a high magnesium problem that was causing the soil to crack. Nuts that fell in the cracks couldn't be harvested. <laughs> There's no cover here. You can see the cracking. Yeah. The Since then, he's seen other benefits. The cover crops are attracting pollinators, preventing weed growth and water evaporation. Nick reaches down to show me the soil under the cover crop. You can see the, uh, <laughs> the difference right there just from this being covered. It's dark, wet, and healthy, and that means it's holding water, which helps replenish the soil under the entire orchard. I think because of, of the deep rooting, and the soil cover, I think we're actually um, having to use less water to irrigate our trees than we normally would. But growing cover crops, like any additional crop, requires more labor. And Nick says not every farmer is convinced of their value. Cover crops um, have their own water requirement. And there's a lot of growers that are hesitant to plant cover crops because they believe that um, that it, it's going to be using up that precious resource. Nick hopes UC Davis researchers can provide some solid data to see if cover crops use less water in the long run and if they have other big payoffs, increasing soil moisture and health, recharging groundwater, and even storing carbon in the soil. Matt Roby is a USDA research scientist collaborating with Isaiah to find out. He stands next to a tall, thin metal tower that hovers over the pistachio trees. It's called a, a flux tower, and what it does is it measures the breathing of the biosphere. It measures the breathing of the uh, agricultural system. He uses a hand crank to tilt the tower down so he can get a closer look at the instruments at the top. He says these instruments measure evapotranspiration, or how much water is lost from the landscape to a thirsty atmosphere. The towers also measure the carbon dioxide exchange of the ecosystem. What the instruments are doing is they're scanning really rapidly the air and kind of sniffing the air for water vapor and carbon dioxide. And based on those changes in the gases, we can determine on average if there's carbon that's being either emitted or released from the landscape and how much water is being released into the atmosphere. Farms typically emit more greenhouse gases than they store, but these cover crops could put a dent in that by sequestering carbon. Isaiah is using other high-tech equipment, including satellites, to look at soil moisture and groundwater. He says the satellite images of Nick's orchard after a recent rainstorm show promise. We take those images and do some computations to estimate soil moisture and I could see a very clear difference in soil moisture between the blocks in this orchard that are cover cropped and the block of the orchard that are not cover cropped. So we see benefits there as well. 
Isaiah says they want to improve satellite algorithms so water managers can measure water use more accurately in California. Scientists will monitor these orchards over several years, both dry years and wet, to understand changes in water use and groundwater recharge as the trees mature. The challenges are great, but also the the advances in science and technology make me hopeful that we can uh, continue to produce nutritious food that we all need while making sure we're creating minimum impacts on the environment. By the way, Kat, you can go to our website and find links to some of those satellite images and you can really see the difference. Are there drawbacks to planting them? Well, Isaiah says the crops may be a great water conservation strategy where Bullseye Farms is located, but may not be everywhere. If you're in the Sacramento Valley where we receive an, on average 17 to 18 inches of rain for a year, we can successfully grow cover crops without increasing our water demand, primarily depending on rainfall to do that. Now, if you're in the southern San Joaquin in Bakersfield, where you get maybe three inches of rainfall, then you have to think about twice about how that would impact your water balance. So it's very site-specific. Everything is very site-specific, right? I learned that even within an orchard, you can have some trees that need more water or fertilizer than others. But we know there are still other benefits from using cover crops that you mentioned, including attracting pollinators, building healthier soils, and potentially storing carbon. Yeah, and speaking of healthier soils, I spoke with one of our Cooperative Extension Assistant Professors, Malika Noko. You may also know her from her Water Talk podcast. She's researching a newer and potentially better cover crop. It's been engineered for places like California where it it doesn't need that much water and it's not going to compete with a cash crop for water. So it's a perennial cover crop. So it's more intended for, um, you know, orchard systems, perennial cropping systems. And it takes very little water to germinate. And we're, we're starting to really understand exactly how much it does need. But it's a great example of like a new solution for how our cover crop could work in a more arid climate. And what's the name of this magical cover crop? Oakville bluegrass. It's a perennial that could last 10 years, and it's dormant in the summer, so theoretically wouldn't compete for water with other crops. But of course, there's not just one solution to growing food with less water. Yeah, in fact, I also went to an almond orchard in Yolo County where they're using a really new technology and also an older one to conserve water. UC Davis plant scientist Patrick Brown is walking down rows of almond trees at West Wind Farms. It's early February and warm. The trees in this orchard are just beginning to bud, which worries owner Kirk Humphrey. <laughs> Little early. Season starts already. Yeah. Hope so we don't get any frosts. Oh boy, don't say that word. You can see the little pink tips coming out. If we had this weather for a week, they'd be blooming. Early blooms worry every almond farmer, and it's happening more often as warming weather from climate change stimulates blooms. The earlier they bloom, the more likely winter frost will damage almonds. Warming temperatures also mean thirstier trees, but Kirk has managed to use less groundwater despite drought conditions last year. This past year, um, we saved of total water volume, it's just right at 5% over the previous years. He's done that in part by using a type of precision irrigation called pulse irrigation. Sophisticated sensors know when the trees need little pulses of water, just enough to replace water lost the previous day. It's the difference between drinking from a fire hose or here's a glass of water. He's pulse irrigating all 160 acres of almonds daily instead of irrigating them twice a week. Patrick Brown says it's a simple concept, just feed the trees when the trees need it. And the analogy is, you know, if you had a, a flock of sheep or a, or a pig farm, you wouldn't put all the food and all the water down at the beginning of the year and hope it was there at the end. You feed according to the hunger. And trees are not any different. So if you have the capacity to pulse the irrigation every day or even less than every day, depending on the demand of the tree, then you can control and prevent losses. 
Another technique to quench the tree's thirst requires no water. It's mulch, which Kirk says every almond farmer has at their disposal. It's the hulls and shells. This is a mixture of the soft hull and the hard hull from processing. And this mixture, uh, its economic value is very low. Most growers sell it to feed cows because it's full of potassium. By putting it on the ground, Patrick says it's feeding the trees. The hull and the shell of almond, which is not the piece you eat, contains about 50% of the fertilizer demand each year. So if you return it to the orchard, then you don't need to put that much fertilizer on. And it also has benefits for organic matter in the soil, and it can save water. Kirk kicks over the top layer of mulch under his trees to reveal dark, moist soil underneath. What it's really done is stop the surface evaporation. You can come out here on a 110 degree day and do the same thing and it'll look just like that. The top will be dry, but you get beyond that top layer, you've got it. It's there. It's also kept out the weeds, eliminating the need for herbicide. So with all the advantages, why don't all growers use mulch? Patrick says it has to do with the traditional way growers harvest almonds. Which is, you grab the tree, you shake the tree, you drop all the nuts on the ground, and then you sweep it up. Now if you're using that process and there's residue on the soil, then it contaminates the nuts. So that's why we haven't done it. But Patrick is working on another project here to harvest almonds so they don't fall on the orchard floor. A new off-ground harvesting machine like this one catches the nuts and recycles the hulls on the orchard floor. The only catch? Farmers must buy the new equipment. It it takes time. Uh, Every change in agriculture takes time. It does take new machines. And there's been some of the big buyers of almonds who are starting to ask growers to adapt the new technologies so that the product they have can be claimed to be more sustainable and green and and environmentally sound. These new technologies and practices seem great for reducing water use, but I keep thinking of the 2,600 basketballs per person analogy. (laughs) I mean, is it really enough to make up for all that water we're drawing out of our aquifers? Well, you know, think about it. Farmers have made some enormous changes in the last few decades. They used to flood the entire field. Now most use more efficient drip irrigation or micro sprinklers. But doing that has also decreased the amount of water that percolates into aquifers. But speaking of flood irrigation makes me think of all of these atmospheric rivers we've had. I know UC Davis is researching ways to capture more of that water and spread it across farm fields. Yeah, the idea is that this could happen in winter months when crops aren't growing or when orchards are dormant. They could also capture it and store it underground. There's a name for it. It's called managed aquifer recharge. Hydrologist Thomas Harder, who is also working with our Agricultural Water Center, says we'll need land and lots of it to do that. We're also thinking about how can we use the agricultural landscape, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of acres. Some places will be able to do a lot of water in a short period of time. Some places will be doing some water over large landscapes and thereby also being able to squirrel away a lot of water into subsurface storage. It's always harder than it sounds. Not all soil will allow water to seep into the aquifer, and diverting water from rivers or creeks means dealing with water rights issues. Yeah, Thomas told me that for the most overpump basins, like those in the San Joaquin Valley, managed aquifer recharge might eventually recover 20 to 40 percent of the groundwater lost every year. Farms and communities will still need to use less. But Thomas says he's hopeful California can achieve sustainable water use. I'm optimistic that we will eventually figure out how to do this for our own livelihood. We have to keep water levels stable. We can't afford the amount of land subsidence that we've seen in the past. We also can't afford to stop growing food. California is the most productive agricultural state in the nation. And Isaiah Kaseka says it's easy to think about the water we drink, but we also need to think about the water we eat. We cannot have food without water and managing water in agriculture is very important for our survival as human beings on this planet. I can't top that. I know, right? I guess it's the perfect time to bounce now. 
Is that how you're ending this episode of Unfold with the basketball metaphor? Well, you know, I think we've bounced around enough ideas, don't you? Yes, definitely. You can learn more about the Agricultural Water Center at our website, ucdavis.edu slash unfold. And check out all of our episodes of Unfold from previous seasons on food, climate change, health, and curiosity. I'm Kat Curlin. And I'm Amy Quinton. Thanks for listening. Unfold is a production of UC Davis. It's edited by Marianne Russ Sharp. Original music for Unfold comes from Damian Barrett and Curtis Jerome Haynes. Additional music comes from Blue Dot Sessions.